Hi. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm all right. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm not. <laughs> you are. Yeah, okay, I am. So I had the amazing experience of having to read your books over and over again for this. And I went on Facebook after I finished Bad Feminist and I said, I really like this person. Um, because all of us who do a lot of reading or writing sometimes get decentralized from the idea that a book allows us to meet a person. Mm -hmm. And what I love so much about your work is that your personality and your opinions and who you are are so intimately entwined with your language. And I just wanted to thank you for that. I think we all do. I think that's one of the reasons people respond so well to bad feminists. It's like meeting a person you really want to know. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. A friend we all want to have. I think I emailed her so many times, like, do you want to talk? She was like, no. And I was like, but I really, really want to talk to you. <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to, to ask you initially, I guess, is you, you've mentioned comfort um, in writing. And, and you talk about feminism as being a word that causes discomfort. And I wanted to know, how do you make people comfortable with feminism? Well, I don't think it's my job yeah. to make people comfortable with feminism. In fact, I just talk about feminism and its importance, and if people are on board with it, that's great, and if they're not, that's their personal issue that they need to work through with you know, whatever deity they see fit. Um, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I think one of the challenges that we face as feminists is this idea that we're expected to make it palatable or comfortable for people. And if you need to be made comfortable with the idea that women and men are equal, I can't help you. Right. Um, right. <laughs> that's just. <laughs> so I, I just focus on being passionate about what I believe. And uh, the comfort I'm seeking to provide is for those people who are traditionally neglected by these sort of conversations and the people who don't see themselves represented in media and in literature. Uh, that's the comfort that, that I look to provide. But in terms of making people okay with feminism, uh, they have to get on board on their own terms. And I feel like feminism, in terms of what it truly is, um, offers all the comfort that anyone could need. Right. When you talk about intersectionality, and that's one of the things we keep hearing over and over again, especially on liberal arts, college campuses. Do you remember what age you were when you realized you had a place in feminism? Because I know for me, when I was growing up, my mom called herself a womanist, mm -hmm. which was to say women of color had been excluded from that. And so they were finding a, an, another space to find themselves in it. Absolutely. And so I want to know, like, what age were you when you felt you had to demarcate the space and enter it? Uh, probably 31. Yes, yeah. late in life. Um, I just never considered myself a feminist until that point. Uh, maybe, no, I was actually 30. And I was working at the University of Nebraska College of Engineering and uh, doing communications. And the men, the faculty I should say, but it's, they were men, <laughs> would talk to me like I'm an idiot. And I thought, well, I can walk around wearing tweed. And <laughs> so, I decided to get my PhD, and that's when I realized the importance of feminism and the, realizing, the importance of knowing that I belonged in the academy and that I could be a part of the academy and that feminism did matter to me. I actually didn't even know what womanism was until I started learning about feminism uh, just because it was not something that was ever taught to me. And I also lived in Nebraska and other predominantly white places where Mainstream feminism was the rule of the day if it was brought up at all. So one of the things you talk about, and it's, it's so interesting, is finding your voice. And, and it's, it's so hard when you're an essayist. I, I mean, especially a woman of color. Because one of the things I always think about is the comment section. Mm. So when you start to write, when you all start to write, the worst thing you, know, you can do is read the comments. Is that, that's what they tell you. And that's where all the nasty people will tell you like, 
I saw your picture. Did you think about getting that mole on your nose removed? And it's like, yeah, I have actually, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but those things can really, really stymie your confidence and your ability to speak your voice and to tell your story. And so one of the things that you talk about is, is finding your voice. And, I, and I'm wondering, has that become easier with this acclaim and these books and, and, and these things, or is it still really difficult and something you have to work at every day? It's becoming more difficult, honestly, mm -hmm. because of the comment sections. I believe in my voice very much at this point, but the comment sections are so dispiriting, and now my parents read them, and my dad gets really hurt by the comment sections of the New York Times, which you would think that the gray lady would moderate that. You would think yeah. with all of their money, but they do not. Um, and they say such cruel things like, how is she teaching? And how dare she face the world with a face like that? And it has nothing to do with the substance of my ideas. Yeah. And so it's very dispiriting and it makes me think my voice doesn't matter because I'm always going to be reduced to these very surface concerns. Um, at the same time, though it's more difficult just because I'm weary and my skin gets thinner and thinner with each piece I publish, um, they make me angry. Right. And they make me just think I'm never gonna shut up because uh, if what I wrote is so good that you had to resort to calling me fat, which is obvious, um, then my work here is done. Right. <laughs> and I know you gave a talk recently where you talked about one of the reasons when we enter these spaces where we aren't represented predominantly and we feel so tense and so angry about them is that our thin is already skin, like our skin is already thin from all of these aggressions and all of these things that we deal with every day. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that history gets completely erased. I mean, it's decontextualized. So you, you go somewhere and, and no one knows that to get there, you've already dealt with an onslaught of things. And one of the things you talk about though is that you don't agree with trigger warnings. Yeah. What do you think about safe spaces and this whole conversation of safe spaces? I like the idea of safe spaces and I think safe spaces are important. I just think we have to understand what we're talking about when we say that we have a safe space. A safe space doesn't mean that you're going to be um, coddled. It means that you're going to be respected. You may become uncomfortable in a safe space, but that's fine. There's nothing wrong with discomfort. And I find that these places of discomfort oftentimes provide really exciting moments of engagement. Uh, so for me, safe space is where people can come and not be degraded for who they are or what they believe. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna hear difficult things. And so it's a challenge. How do we create these safe spaces in an unsafe world? And how do we create safe spaces in a world where people seem to not have any understanding of what it means to respect one another? Um, and so I think it's, we just have to continue to model what safe space looks like. And we have to continue to push against the narrative of generally white men and wealthy people who believe that safe space means that we all sort of want to be cosseted in our mother's arms um, and fed with a baby bottle. Yeah, right, that's what you've lived with your entire life. Right. <laughs> Um, I'm sure that's very pleasant, but we're just asking to not be shot when we get pulled over by a police officer. So, yeah. Right. Or that's just have the ability for people to understand to get here. Mm -hmm. What it are, took. It's been so unsafe. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to talk about in this conversation about safe space is how unsafe our lives actually mm -hmm. are, even when we're lucky. Right. Um, I don't think people understand um, the exhaustion that many of us are feeling and uh, they don't know what we've been through to get to this point, to be alive. And uh, we have to find ways to get that story out. The thing that I kept circling back in Bad Feminist is your childhood in Nebraska. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> I don't know anything about, like I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, you don't know anything about the middle of America. And I was like, I don't. I, and I was born in Indiana. Wait, I kind of whoa, imagined. let's back up. 
You were born in Indiana? I, I don't tell anyone that. I don't know why I told you guys that. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. It's like, you know, your nerves. I'm just like, I was born in Indiana. Uh, Girl, but where? I was. <laughs> where in Indiana? Bloomington. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I live in Indiana. So. You, yeah, you're, you do. I do. You do. Circle it's of true. life. It is. <laughs> yes. You find yourself in strange. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I grew up, I remember I went to school once and someone called me a bad word and my grandfather told me another word to call them and I went and I called them and they were like, whoa. So that's my <laughs> only Indiana memory is that like I learned to insult people in Indiana. That sounds about right. And I, it benefited me my whole life. So I'm grateful to Indiana, but I've, you know, I, I was thinking of myself as an East Coaster because that, that was my formative Midwest experience. And I went to all Quaker schools and everything else. It wasn't like I grew up in terribly diverse environments, but what was that like for you? It was interesting. In some ways, it was great. Uh, my brothers and I were very well loved, and we lived, you know, we had clean air and nicely <laughs> cut lawns <laughs> and strict Haitian parents sort of micromanaging the entire affair. Um, <laughs> But we had this uh, empty lot next door to our house for many years, and we built this tunnel world. I mean, they, we called them tunnels, but they were, we, you could see our heads when we walked through. <laughs> 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 oh, we really believed in ourselves. Um, and you see where it got me. Um, so it was great in that regard. It was isolating in that there was no one else other than my family that looked like me, especially in my neighborhood. And, I didn't realize that was a problem until we started to go to Port-au-Prince during the summers mm -hmm. and I would meet other people who looked like me and hear people who sounded like my parents and thought like my parents. And then I would have to go back to Nebraska and all of a sudden I really began to understand race mm -hmm. and what I was in this strange land. But you can't take the Nebraska out the girl. How so? Um, whenever people ask where I'm from, I say Nebraska, like I'm proud of that shit. Like, <laughs> Nebraska! <laughs> and um, I'll give you some trivia, but on game day, um, the Nebraska Cornhuskers football stadium is the third largest city in Nebraska. <laughs> oh yeah, the struggle is real, it is so real. <laughs> But I learned a lot of good things there, and I was, even though, I, you know, I was the only one or one of two when my little brother, for example, came to school, <laughs> um, I had a good childhood. I can look back and say I had a good childhood. I read your, your mother and you in conversation together. Yes. I don't know if you all have read this, but it, it's not in your book, no. this piece. If you can, if you can find it online. I told her I was kind of stalking her before, and she was like, nice. Um, and I was like, can we talk about your mom? And she's like, sure. Um, but your mom, Miss Gay, I'm gonna call her Mrs. Gay, um, she <laughs> talked a lot about how she raised you all yes. to sort of strive for excellence. And you talk about excellence in your book. Um, a lot, and I think it's something that we hear as women a lot, you especially hear it as women of color. My father's from Africa, so, you know, the whole immigration story, like I remember once I was like, I need money, and he was like, when I went to King's Cross when I was 16, I had no money, I sold hats, sell hats, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> where? Where do I get hats? So, but that sense of do more, do more, do more, it, it, it can be exhausting, right? And I wonder, you know, and you talk about this, the price of ambition. Mm -hmm. How have you sort of mitigated excellence on your own terms? You're, you're obviously excellent now, but yes. does it still weigh on you? You know, it how does. do we work through that, that sort of demand on ourselves? I'm still trying to find the answer to that. I'm relentless, I never rest. And I recognize that part of it does come from my childhood and this push toward excellence. And I understand where it comes from and why they did that. Uh, they were arming us. They were arming us for being black in this world. And they wanted my brothers and I to be as well equipped as possible, uh, intellectually and emotionally. At the same time, I resent how hard I have to work and still receive a fraction of the recognition that uh, a white person might receive. And then I hate that I choose that as the measure 
we need a new measure of excellence. Like, I, you know what, I'm the measure of excellence. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm also trying to broaden for myself and for others and for what I see in others. I want to be better about what I consider excellence. That excellence can take many different forms and that success can take many different forms and not all of the material. And so I'm it's, a, you know, it's a work in progress in terms of that, but it's hard to overcome that training and that immigrant narrative, especially when you see that narrative play out in successful ways, that my parents came here, they didn't speak English, they learned the language, they educated themselves, and they made a very good life for themselves. So of course they believe in the American dream, and how could I not believe in that dream? Until, of course, you look beyond your own experience and you see how the dream fails so many people. So it's definitely, it's a difficult thing for me, but I still embrace excellence, I do. I think you can't overcome certain things that are coded in who you are at a very young age. Yeah, and, and you talk about the other girlhood in your book. So we watch girls and, you know, I'm one of those people who when I heard about girls, I didn't, when I looked at the four girls and didn't see anyone who looked like me, I was like, I don't have time for this. Um, <laughs> but yet, I still watch Sex in the City religiously and cringe when, you know, like Carrie, they go to like a, a, a engagement party for someone and there's a black woman and it's her engagement and they're like, yeah, girlfriend. And I'm like, what is Sarah Jessica Parker doing? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> so we get used to sort of seeing ourselves in stereotypical ways, if not at all, mm -hmm. and sort of saying, well, we're the other girlhood and, and, and these sort of things. And one of the things I thought was so great about your book is that you talk about finding yourself in those girlhoods that don't represent us. So Sweet Valley High, so you guys are, Oh, I'm 33, you're younger than us, but growing up, that was a book I loved as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that was instructional and important to be able to find yourself in representations that do not look like you? I think it was survival. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you work with what you have. Right. And for so long, I didn't even know that there were black writers. I mean, it's so shocking, but American education in the suburbs is really, really narrow, especially when I grew up, I'm 41. And back then, there was no such thing as diverse curricula. That this was just not something that happened, especially not in Omaha, Nebraska. And so I just had to work with what I had, and I had to look beyond identity um, into personality. And so things like Little House in the Prairie, I saw a lot of myself in Laura Ingalls Wilder um, as she's portrayed in the novels. Um, as Half Pint, who is sort of a tomboy and mischievous, and she loves her family, but she's independent and gets in trouble sometimes. And Sweet Valley High was entirely aspirational for me uh, <laughs> because I was so desperately unpopular, and I really wanted to be popular and loved, and I wanted to go to the mall with the girls, and I was a Jessica, of course. <laughs> and anyone who knows me would be like, nerd, sit down. Um, you're an Elizabeth, but Elizabeth is so dreary. No. Um, and so I think it was just survival and this idea of looking for myself more than anything else. The thing that I always think about with those books that I love, like I, I read a lot of, do you guys read like Wrinkle in Time and, and those, like that's my oh, favorite God. book, okay? So if it's like, you know, it's like a dark and stormy night, I'm like, I'm gonna curl up with Meg and Charles Wallace and people are like, what's wrong with you? But so those characters, <laughs> it was this unlikely sort of dorky girl who can change the world, can change the universe, the cosmos. And one of the things I was thinking about coming over here is that you talk about, you know, Little House on the Prairie. Mm -hmm. I love those books, same way. They're all sort of unlikely heroines. Like, it's like, it takes an incident for that, the girls to rise to the occasion of, of being able to say, I can go out and change this world. They never sort of approach it like, well, here's my sword and I'm already ready. You know, it's like something has to happen for women to, to rise to that place where they feel comfortable. Have you noticed that? Do you think that that's a detriment when you look back at those books? Or do you think that they sort of create, it's just narrative and that's, it's just the way the story kind of goes? I think it's more than how the story kind of goes, but I don't think it's a detriment. Right. I think that it's a reality and that those books understood that women have to work harder. Right. 
and that we're not given, like, we're not Arthur. We don't get to walk up and the sword just pops into our hand. We've got to chisel that shit out of the rock. <laughs> so uh, I definitely understood where it comes from, and I didn't mind it. I mean, I like the idea of, and you even see this in Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, that sometimes the hero has to work for it and they don't recognize their calling. And so I enjoyed those stories for that reason. Um, and I think one of the real reasons is because I felt like I was really awesome on the inside and nobody else saw it. And so I could read these books where meek girls become amazing and believe that maybe someday I too could become amazing. So one of the things I was thinking about, Roxanne, and this is something you write about, is that you were talking about violence. Yes. And you talk, you question yourself about writing about violence. And until, so Roxanne also wrote a novel. Yeah. And it's being turned into a movie. Yeah. Which is, have you guys heard this? Yeah. This is amazing. And isn't it like an all black female producer, yes. director, the whole thing? The producers are white. It's okay. It's okay. We'll no, take your fine. money. I mean, but you. Have <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's actually a really diverse group of people working on yeah. this movie. Um, the producers are amazing. It's Michael DeLuca, Mindy Schultes, and Michael Hanel. And through Fox Searchlight, and Annika, our executive at Fox Searchlight, is a black woman. When I walked into the meeting and I saw her, I, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was like, girl, really? <laughs> I did not know that there were black executives in Hollywood. Right. And now I know. But the director is Gina prince Bythewood, who did Love and Basketball Amazing. and The Secret Life of Bees. Yeah. And then um, the actress the, who's going to play Mireille is also a black woman, uh, Gugu Mbatha-Ra. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be okay, ladies. I'll get all you. I'll hook it up. <laughs> So I was really thrilled that, um, to have so many black women involved in the production of the movie. And what's so amazing about this book is that it's, it's not an easy book. I mean, we often see black women stories. My favorite black woman movie, though. Wait, did you know, Thank you. Okay. So it, it's totally like, you watch those movies and it's almost like, do you have someone who is watching this for continuity? Weird things happen. It does. Are they really friends? They're like, you got divorced, girl? I didn't know. So you never know, kind of, <laughs> are these real movies about black women? Are these real movies about women of color? And one of the things that I think is so important about this book being turned into a movie is that it's not an easy story whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about violence, Roxanne, what I, what I want to return to is this. You talk about wondering, is it exploitative? Mm -hmm. And you talk about, do you have sort of the right to go there? And I guess I'm wondering, do you think, what I wonder is, I, I wonder if men ask that question of themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, I wonder if Michael Bay, when he does a completely violent movie, wonders, do I have a right to exploit this sort of thing for narrative? And you think about this so patiently and, and so complexly. And I wonder, what did you arrive at? Because you leave it as a question. Yes. That's a good question. And Michael Bay doesn't think about anything. Let alone, <laughs> let alone, um, he doesn't. I mean, his movies are fun, but let's be real. There's literally no thought that went into any of that. Um, you know, one of the, the answer I've come to, I'll start with the answer I've come to, and the answer is that I have every right to write these stories. And the reason I have every right is exactly for that reason. As I was writing the novel, I just thought, I really worried about how people would see Haiti. And I didn't want them to think that this was the single story about the Haitian experience or what it means to live in Haiti or be Haitian, because it's not. But I just love this kind of story that's melodramatic and that also tackles big questions. And I thought, does Dennis Lehane sit around worrying about how his novels are going to reflect on Boston? And I realized, no, he writes what he feels compelled to write. And I have that right to do so as well. And so I decided I have a right to write about violence. And I have a right to write about violence in communities of color without having that define what it means to be from a community of color. Um, because violence is a global issue. Right. So for me, the question then becomes, how do I write about violence? 
And so for an untamed state, I was very deliberate and I was very explicit in writing the violence because I wanted it to be unreadable, which is a strange thing to say as a writer. I want you to read my novel very much, but I want the rape scenes to be unreadable in the same way that they should be unwatchable in a movie. When you watch movies all too often, sexual violence is glorified, it's glossy, it's almost erotic, and you can sit through it. And I thought of the movie Irreversible by Gaspar Noé, and it's right. a horrifying film that has a 10 minute rape scene. That is the most horrific thing I've ever seen in my life. And it is literally unwatchable. You cannot sit through the whole scene without compromising your soul in some way. And I, I didn't want to go that far, but I did think about how unwatchable that scene was and how it depicted rape as it can be. And I wanted to write rape as it could be um, in this circumstance of a kidnapping and a woman at the mercy of several men. And I thought to do service to Mireille's story, I had to go there. And I felt like it was the right choice. And the other thing is that we don't talk about that in our community sometimes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what you find, and, and one of the last profiles I wrote about was the, the First Lady of New York City, and she was talking about how you when she was going out to sell their mental health initiative, she would go to communities in New York City where people would say, we don't have mental illness. Mm -hmm. We don't have that issue. We don't talk about it. And so this sort of coming out of our, our, our unveiling the secrecy is a trans transgression amongst ourselves mm -hmm. that we often don't do, and it's really, really important. It is, and I think that there are so many burdens to being a person of color because when you talk about the negative things, that's all people hear. Right. And they choose to use that as a form of definition instead of just an aspect. And so I really, really worried about that. And many Haitians don't like to talk about kidnapping right. and uh, that it happens. But uh, the shame isn't kidnapping. The shame is the economic circumstance that leads people to believe that stealing people from their lives is a viable source of economics. Um, and so let's talk about that. Let's talk about absolute poverty uh, in a country 700 miles from the United States. So I, I, I grapple with this quite a lot about how do we talk about not only the great parts of our community, and Haiti is amazing. There are so many wonderful things. And I do try to also write about the wonderful things in the novel. Mm -hmm. And it's weird, but nobody ever talks about that. Right. Um, but I think we can do so alongside the more difficult truths. And I also, you know, when people come up to me and say, well, I'm never going to Haiti, I say, well, I was gang raped in New Jersey. Good luck with that. Um, yeah. Right, because this violence happens everywhere. It happens everywhere, in every country, in every state, in every city. It just happens everywhere. Um, and there's only one common denominator. Right. Men. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, sorry, that, I just had to. <laughs> Can I ask you, you, you sometimes retweet pictures of men reading Bad Feminist. Yeah. <laughs> and they're on the train and they'll always look very They look studious, like, studious. I better take notes yeah. for my woman. Yes. The recovery, I mean, Walter Benjamin says a thing, you know, like justice is found through study. And to look at those pictures of these men reading your book, I'm like, justice, yes. <laughs> you know, they're into it. Did you think about a broad audience for this book or did you, did you have no audience in mind when you wrote it? I had no audience in mind. No audience no. in mind. I'm, I wish I were that sophisticated. <laughs> I'm not. I literally just write for fun, especially when I started. I mean, my career is very different now than it was six years ago when I wrote most of these essays. Um, so when I wrote them, I was writing for myself and I was grappling with various questions of identity and culture. And um, so I wasn't really thinking about audience and to see the audiences that have emerged. Like if you had told me universities would be reading Bad Feminist, I would have been like, you, why are you lying? That's, that's not gonna happen. Uh, it's been awesome and that men and women are reading this book, I like that. And I think you write to be read and I wanna be read by as many people as possible. And so 
I, I love seeing those pictures of the men reading it because you can just see that they're so proud of themselves. <laughs> really for like daring to read a book about <laughs> feminism in public like oh bless your heart <laughs> it's just so sweet and women love to tweet at me about how they read it and it's a great man repellent <laughs> and that no one will speak to them when they're reading bad feminists so there's a tip for everyone <laughs> but I just love seeing how the book you, once you write a book and publish it it's out of your control you, you don't get to control how it's consumed or how people respond to it. So I just still get a thrill from just seeing various people reading it and doing things with it and engaging with it and so on. Someone tweeted a kid who had colored all over the cover and I was like, yes. <laughs> Live your best life. <laughs> but the strange thing is whenever you, you know, I meet a lot of young writers and they, and they say, well, how do you start to write? essays, or how do you even start to write, right? Like, so it's different than when you're in college and you're like, I have to write this paper, I have to do this thing. You imagine that there's some sort of cognitive leap between publishing and just writing in your journal. And I think this next question is probably sort of filtering what I imagine some people are wondering. When did you first decide that you were capable of being a professional writer? Because that's a really hard step to make. A lot of us feel like, I write in my journal, I feel like I'm really good at this thing. But how does one actually make that step towards saying, this is what I'm going to do, putting my feet into it, you know, not listening to my parents who probably are like, how are you gonna pay your student loans? All of these things that make it detrimental. I don't know that I ever ask myself that question. I've just always written and I've always had a job alongside that. I never thought I could make a living as a writer. That was just not something I ever entertained. I just knew I wanted to write and that I wanted to be read. And so when I was 19, I started to send my work out because throughout my teens, I had read Writer's Digest, which is such a cheesy magazine, but I loved it. It was like a Bible for me. And I would read the writer's market every year and I would like get my little stamps and envelopes and send my very sad work out into the world and hope for the best. And um, I just did it over and over again. And I got so many no's and I was like, okay. And I allowed myself to be hurt and then I continued to send work out. It was just sheer stupidity um, to get my work out into the world. And then when I went to get my PhD, I was in Houghton, Michigan, which is in Michigan's northern upper peninsula. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's 10 hours north of Detroit. And it was so isolated and so remote that I was like, well, I'm gonna have to write to survive this. Right. And I just started to write at an uncanny pace. And that's when I realized I had gotten to a place where my work would be rejected less. I just realized I was getting better. Or I had all those years of writing and being rejected had done something for me. And so I took myself more seriously and started to target my submissions and really think instead of just vomiting my work to every editor in the world. Like I would just send the saddest shit to the New Yorker, <laughs> right. which I still do. Yeah. <laughs> still not working. Um, <laughs> I but think it's working. <laughs> I'm going to beat down that door. <laughs> David Remick is going to publish me someday. Um, I just got better and smarter, and I started to take it just that much more seriously as like a second job, a second job that didn't pay. <laughs> that didn't pay a penny. And um, I just took it more and more seriously, and I, then I was taken more and more seriously. And so I just kept sort of unlocking new levels of writerdom. Uh, but it really just happened with persistence and ignorance. There's, do you guys know Donna Haraway? She's oh Paris. my God, Cyborg Manifesto. C Cyborg Manifesto. I teach that, it's one so of my that, favorites. I love that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love is that she talks about women of color, and women in general, as being cyborgs, right? And it's, that, it's because we're, we're assembling ourselves so consistently with all of these parts that don't necessarily become conglomerate or make sense, right? And one of the things that you do so well, Roxanne, it's like, it, it blows my mind, is how you assemble yourself on the page. And so all of these things that to me would not make sense, Nebraska, Sweet Valley High, Haiti, feminism, uh, Judith Butler, come together. And the other thing that's amazing to me is how you balance this extreme confidence with what you really are open about, which we all have, right? Which is like low self-esteem. And I want to know, how do you get comfortable with putting that on the page? 
I write like no one's reading. And I don't mean that in a cheesy way, like a bumper sticker way, but I literally delude myself into believing no one reads my work so that I can be as honest as possible on the page. And I've always looked at my life and I've never really fit in everywhere for the reasons that you point out. I'm just this, this mix of improbable combinations. Like even I look and I'm like, whoa. A, a Haitian in Nebraska? Yeah. I mean, come on. It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense at all. And so I, I realized that that is what makes me into the thinker that I am. And so I've come to embrace these disparate markers of my identity. And my dad, of all people, who's this engineer who's very straight-laced but also kind of funny, always told me, do something that no one else is doing. And I have taken that very seriously as a writer. And I realize that nobody can see or narrate the world the way I can. It doesn't mean that I'm special. It just means that no one can do it the way I can do it. And so I've tried to use that to my advantage. And one of the things that you do so well is talk about these bodies that we all live in, right? And the extreme discomfort that you experience and that we all kind of experience. Um, and your new book, Hunger, which I wrote to you and I said, can you send me a galley? And you were like, no, I'm still working. What are you talking about? But it was, I think, my absolute desire to know what you're going to write about this. And I don't know if you guys have seen some of the blurbs that are coming out, but one of the things that you say is that this is not a triumph narrative. And that one of the things we see with Oprah, right, those commercials, and she says, I eat bread every day. This is the most successful I've, I've ever I've eaten had. bread every day every in day 2016. Since, exactly. And I'm sitting here like, so have I. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we always see that there's like a quick fix or there's some sort of dramatic longing we should have when we have a billion dollars to still want to lose weight or to, as you say, discipline these bodies that we live in as women. And I wonder if, you know, Bill Gates has ever sat around thinking, I need to discipline, you know, wearing glasses to be a more attractive human while I'm controlling <laughs> the universe. Um, you know, it's, it's really disheartening. To, that broke my heart to see Oprah saying that, you know? And so when you're saying it's not a triumph narrative, that's really important. And I want to know what, what is that going to look like and why do you think that that's going to be, why, why you're taking that shift and that lens and that look at it? Yes, I love that question. But first, let's talk about Oprah. Okay. Because I have yeah. a little chapter. And my, the chapters in Hunger are very short. Some of them right. are just like 300 words long. Um, I'm obsessed with her, well, the reason she's doing the commercials is she bought like a 10 or $40 right. million dollar stake right. in Weight Watchers, right. so she's being a businesswoman. But it's heartbreaking that at her age, 63, I think, she's worrying about, let's make this the year of our best body. I'm like, you're a billionaire. It's just, why don't you make this the year of sleeping in a bed of dollar bills? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's sad to see that even at her level of success, she can't find happiness in her body with a chef and a personal trainer. And so, damn, what, how am I gonna yeah, exactly. make this work, right? I see you. I don't even know. <laughs> I just don't know. Um, I decided to write Hunger, again, because of my father's advice, to do something that no one else is doing. I read a magazine article, probably in People. I actually just talked about this earlier today. But um, it was a triumph story of a woman who was standing in a picture of her pants. And she was standing in one leg instead of both, because she had lost that much weight. And she had lost like 238 pounds. And I was very jealous, and I just thought, that's amazing. And then I thought, nobody ever writes about what it's like to live in an obese body in this world, where you have to, for example, look at the size of a seat and the arms, and are you going to fit? And is the chair going to break if you sit in it? And um, are you going to be able to navigate a physical space? And when you're in the grocery store and people are putting things in your cart, or taking things out because they think you shouldn't eat it. Like, what is that humiliation like? We never hear about it. And so I'm writing that book. Um, and because I think it needs to, I think people need to understand what it's truly like to be obese. And not like, oh, I'm 20 pounds overweight. I just, I really need to lose weight. I don't want to disrespect you if you're 20 pounds overweight. I'm happy for you. Um, <laughs> but what is it like when you're 200 pounds overweight? 
and um, nobody ever wants to talk about it unless you are watching one of those horrific shows on TLC, um, obesity porn. Uh, and so this is sort of just, what is it like to live in this world? Why do you think those shows exist? <sighs> it's pornography. It's absolutely hitting a pleasure zone of some kind. To see obesity so rampantly out of control that someone needs to be cut out of their home and to see them sort of being punished right. for their obesity by the doctors and the nurses and the dietitians who are saying, you have to do better. Um, it, it, there's, I think there's a catharsis for us in watching that. I actually wrote a short story that's in my upcoming collection about this called This Program Contains Surgical Procedures. And it's about a couple who fucks after they watch these shows. Um, and I do think that people do get something out of that. And then it's also a sense of triumph. Uh, look at this 700 pound person who goes to that hospital in Houston with that evil little doctor. And um, I mean, he seems nice enough, but he's just so mean. <laughs> and they um, either have to lose weight before they can have the surgery or they have to have some sort of physical abnormality removed so that they can do this or do that. And we see, you know, we see them eating before in the before, eating just horrific amounts of food. Food, I mean, amounts that you know are, are that they're seeking comfort. They're seeking something. Nobody eats that much just, just for fun. I mean, they're, they're getting something out of it. And we, I think we like watching that. And I think it's a good cautionary tale. Like, oh, I, don't, I'm, I can't let that happen to me. And those shows flourish. Uh, two weeks ago, I was actually in LA in my hotel. And I was pretty bummed out. And so I decided to watch my 600 pound life um, to make myself feel even worse. And I watched a marathon of these shows, and it was just, it was bleak. It was bleak, but I kept watching. <laughs> and yeah, it's bleak. Yeah, and reality TV is so interesting. I watched Love and Hip Hop for the first time. Oh, that's my favorite show. It is? <laughs> Straight up. I um, too, actually. <laughs> whenever Peter Guns gives advice. Well, that's, that's what I was gonna say. I'm like, sir, but you sir. Watch, you watch those shows, and there was someone you know, I felt terrible because I was like failing at something in life, you know, like I think my editor was like, where's the piece? And I was like, I don't know, man, I didn't even start writing it. So then I watched Love and Hip Hop for like two days because that's what you do when you're on deadline. Amen. And, <laughs> and what I realized is, what, you're right though, it's so interesting because it's like, I watched someone be like, I'm in a bad space too. I'm gonna go talk to my uncle Tretch from Naughty by Nature. And I thought, I'm not in that bad of a space, you know? <laughs> so I felt some sort of distance between my failure and my ability to be like, I could be failing like this person is in life, mm -hmm. talking to someone from not I by know which episode you're talking her, about. Career advice. Mm -hmm. so and then Tretch gave her the worst, worst advice. advice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what happens when you ask like a 90s rapper mm -hmm. for career advice. So, but it's true, we do watch those shows sort of to say, this is how someone else is failing. And Zadie talks, Zadie Smith, another great writer who just talks about failing better mm -hmm. and that there's an obsession with how we fail and, and that, that getting comfortable with failure and that we really aren't comfortable. So it's easier to watch someone else doing it or to watch it happening outside of ourselves rather than. And we're unable to judge it or remove. Right. Like Love and Hip Hop is, which is created by a Haitian woman, my people. She's Haitian. Um, yeah, Mona Scott Young. Right. And um, you know, that show in particular, you have these really beautiful and intelligent women who date these redeemless men and then like allow themselves to be humiliated on national television by these men. I'm obsessed with Peter Guns. Peter Guns is a man on the show who has a wife and a, another wife. A sister wife. A sister wife, yeah. yes, that, that live in the same apartment building. And he has children with both, but he also has other children with other women elsewhere. And I don't judge any of that. Um, I do judge that he puts his two women in the same building though, and he'll go like, when he's fighting with one, he'll <laughs> go to the other. And um, he acts like there's nothing wrong with this. And the reason I say that is because they're not in a polyamorous relationship. No. They each think they're in a monogamous relationship with Peter Guns, um, but they also know about each other. It's, it's all fascinating. But and it allows to us to, show. you have to watch it. It's the most, 
It's the, way the most that compelling she's like stuff. engaging with it, it. It was like me. I mean, I, literally, it's it's crazy. I never used to watch it, and then I noticed around nine o'clock on Mondays and Tuesdays, people would start tweeting. Yeah. About this show, and I was like, I don't know what mess they're talking about, but I'm into it. And, so and I they always do like. L H H H and yes. so the hashtag. So you just see it happening and they're like, Peter, yes. no, L A H H. And I was like, what is And Peter? that's not even the best yeah. part of the show. I'm gonna tell you about the best part of the show. <laughs> the best part of the show is that during the confessionals with the producers, they all talk with their hands in very specific ways that let you know that they've probably taken some acting classes provided by the show with the same thing. And so like there's a woman named Yandy on the show and so she'll be like, so I'm trying to work on my paper while my boy, her, her, friend, her husband's name is Maldices or something like that. And <laughs> while he, <laughs> Mendices, while he's working out his prison thing and this is a true story. Um, and I just don't know. So I'm gonna work with Rashida on making this uh, this music video because I have to get my paper and surprise, you know, to, it, and she does this. And then in the next confessional, this woman named Erica, who is one of Peter Guns's women, will say, I don't know how long I can deal with Peter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see, because, but he's a good father to my two sons, but I just, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> And then Peter Guns will come on and say, I love them both. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do, but, uh, and so just watch it. <laughs> no, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> so one of the things you always hear from established magazines now is like Twitter. They're very angry at Twitter because Twitter is kind of like the empire strikes back. It, I mean, it's like beyond George Lucas's imagination that people would take this form of technology to say we're here and we're thinking. And especially women and especially people who've been marginalized. And so I take the stance of I'm firmly on the side of Twitter, although I will not tweet because I don't want to destroy my life because I'm the sort of person who would say something offhand and ruin myself. But one of the things that I think is so interesting is like you have this very engaged Twitter audience. And I want to know, what do you think about the criticism people have about the way women of color particularly have sort of galvanized themselves through this medium, right? We talk about technology all the time, but we, we don't always think about how people sort of appropriate technology for our own power. And so one of the, you know, you're thinking about love and hip hop and it's like, it's become this national viewing thing where black people from all over the world can watch this show kind of together and talk about it, and, and Empire is the same way. And do you think that those things are important? Or do Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yeah. A, I think it's good to have fun. It's good to be entertained. You know, the challenge is that we need to be media literate so we understand the troubles with how we're being entertained and so that we can demand better entertainment. But I will love being on Twitter during award ceremonies, during Empire, which is amazing, during Love and Hip Hop. Um, I don't watch, I haven't had time to watch primetime television like on schedule anymore, but during Scandal. Um, I think it's, it provides a sense of community. It allows those of us, like, you know, again, living in rural Indiana, it allows me to feel connected to other people, and especially other women, other queer people, other people of color. Um, it's fantastic. I think there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I, we, we, we demean entertainment far too much. Life is short. Let's enjoy ourselves once in a while. Um, I, I do. And I also think that marginalized people are using Twitter in some really exciting ways. Uh, they're allowed to express themselves. We are allowed to express ourselves. Um, and you can't control it. You can't right. stop us. You can't contain the number of followers we have. Either we're gonna have a lot of followers or we're not, but it's on our own merits. You don't get to gatekeep. And I think that's thrilling. And there are some issues, certainly, with how certain people use Twitter and other social media, but let's not pretend that it's only black women who, for example, as you said, um, are doing problematic things in the world. Everybody is doing problematic things in the world. So you guys have questions, right? I'm sure. Yeah. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Throw a hand up. If you want to ask a question. 
Um, hi, thank you for uh, the conversation. You both had a lot of great things to say. Um, Roxanne, I was really struck by when you described yourself as a mix of improbable combinations because that like that really like hit home for me. I feel like that a lot of the time too. And I feel like I have to spend a lot of time either like interacting with people or in my writing, since I'm trying to do more writing these days, um, justifying like that mix and like, well, this is why I'm this, but also I'm this. And I know that seems weird, but like it's who I am. So do you ever feel that urge to like justify yourself and your background? And if so, like, do you give into it? How do you resist it? How do you deal with it? I, I have felt that urge. I don't feel it anymore because I think I'm established enough that people, if they want to see the justifications, they can read my earlier work. Um, what I try to do is explain because sometimes people do need context to understand how I've come to a certain point of view. But I, I don't think we should ever waste our energy justifying our existence. We are who we are and people should just take it um, at that. Uh, but it's a really tough thing to get, it's a really tough to get to that place where you believe that, that you don't have to justify yourself. And so just start doing it a little less and a little less and a little less with each new piece and you will sort of work it out of your system eventually. Hi Roxanne, I'm a, a big fan of yours and um, what really struck me tonight is you talked about the way you write like no one's reading, right? But not in a weird bumper sticker way or anything like that. What's always impressive, and I think all of your audience would agree, your ability to tell the truth. So my question is, what caused you to do that? How did you develop this ability to tell the truth and not give a fuck who was reading it? And how can we do that? Yeah. Um. I kept secrets for a very long time about who I was, about what I had been through, and I didn't want to do that anymore. And I always just tried to make myself conform to whatever space I was in. I tried to be a chameleon. I tried to be whatever people wanted me to be in whatever space I was in. And I didn't want to do that anymore. And so because I thought no one was going to read my work, even though, of course, I want to be read, but because I allowed myself to believe no one was reading my work, I just allowed myself to write who I really am and what I really think because I just had nothing to lose. Um, I wasn't living in New York. I wasn't part of a fancy writer's community. I never have been. And so I didn't have any social capital to sacrifice. I don't have a lot of friends. So, like, you know, my family knew I was a writer, but they were like, oh, you know, they're there. Um, supportive, but not getting it. Now they get it. <laughs> but <laughs> I also think that I knew that there was nothing I could write that would cost me the love of my family. And so I think also just being well-loved by my family allowed me. But really, it was just t being tired of contorting myself to be what people wanted me to be, it was so much easier to just be myself. And so you just have to stop contorting yourself. Uh, and it is a risk, it is a risk. And when people criticize my work, it's hard to separate the criticism that I need to take that's constructive and what I feel is a criticism of who I am. That's the hard part. And I'm still working on that. But I think the more mature you become as a writer, the more you're able to do those separations. And, and I think that people show themselves when they critique and in the tone and the tenor of their critique. And so that also helps me to decide, okay, I'm going to be myself today. Oh, thank you. Yes. Just take it down, pass it around. Hi. Hello. Thanks for coming here. Thank you for having I've me. I've chased you around like four different college campuses. I keep missing you. I was like, I got here like 4.45 today. I was so excited. That's what's up. Um, so one of the things I love a lot, especially in an untamed state, is that not all of these issues get 
resolved. They don't have clear conclusions. You know, she doesn't necessarily ever forgive her father. You know, they, it kind of just, things happen the way they really happen in life, which is that sometimes dust just settles and you move on. And um, I know that's maybe not always, like a resistance to very strong conclusions and resolutions is may, maybe not always super popular with publishers. How much pushback did you get? How much did you have to fight um, with your publishers? How long did it take to find somebody who was just going to let you do your thing? Yes, it took 18 months. It took a long time to sell the novel. But I've had no pushback from my publisher. Grove Atlantic has been so extraordinarily supportive. And my editor, Amy Hunley, who is a goddess, I, I mean, and I'm not just saying that, I really do love her and appreciate her. She read my novel, she understood my novel, and she didn't try to change any of it. She did have suggestions. We did work on it, and she gave it a really good edit. Um, but I told her that trauma is not ever neatly resolved. And I, I also told her that I was committed to the violence, and so I actually did cut out two scenes. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are two even worse scenes that I cut out. Um, there's something wrong with me. But um, I understood what she was saying in terms of that, but she respected the overall tone that I was going for. And so I, I, have had no, I had no issue in that regard. It was just getting someone to believe it and believe it could be done. In terms of all the editors who read it over those 18 months, there were people who said it was too dark, who it was too violent, that nobody wants to read a story about a wealthy Haitian family, um, that the ending is too depressing. The original ending was actually a lot more depressing than what it is now. Um, things like that. And so it was difficult, but again, just ignorance. So my agent was like, I'm not giving up, neither should you. So I was just like, all right, let's keep sending it out. Um, one of my favorite parts of Bad Feminist is your chapter or essay on Scrabble. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you're still competing and how your Scrabble game is going. My Scrabble game is tight. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to play in a tournament in a while because I've just been on the road pretty much since 2014. Um, but I play online every day. I'm playing 17 games right now. <laughs> it's great. I keep learning new words and it's just awesome. It's my happy place. Last question, and um, afterwards there's going to be a book signing in the lobby. Hi. Hi. Um, I appreciate a lot of the things that you've said about writing in your own voice and um, taking the time to make sure that you're reflecting your own experience and explaining and earlier justifying. And I think that um, what I'm finding is a lot of those things don't happen by accident. They require a lot of intentionality and discipline. And so I was wondering if you could share if there's any sorts of self-care practices or daily disciplines or things that you do to just make yourself able to do that on a regular basis. No, I wish. <laughs> I, I'm not very good at self-care, but I do write every day and I read every day um, because it's a job. And I don't mean that in a burdensome way. It's a job that brings me immense amounts of joy and sanity, quite frankly. Um, and when I'm sitting down to write, I am intentional. I am thinking very carefully about the questions that I'm grappling with. And how do I grapple with these questions in a way that is not simply navel-gazing? Uh, and I don't know that I always succeed, but that's what I'm aiming for. Um, and so I always try, like if I have an intentionality, it's about making sure that my inquiry is productive and relevant, not only to me, but to anyone who might be reading my work. Um, and so another thing I think that I do probably every day is look at what people are talking about online, especially, sort of the issue of the day, and think about how do I talk about this with someone who would disagree with me, but is willing to hear my point of view? 
And that also shapes a lot of my work, um, thinking about nuance and empathy in that way. Uh, because I truly believe that in order to create change, we do have to, at some point, speak to one another when we disagree. Um, and so we have to find effective ways to do that. And so I'm always just trying in how I live and how I think and how I write to, to get closer to that place of being able to do so. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.